Cheeky, clever, irreverent and sometimes poignant, Michael Rosen's words have captivated generations of children and adults. The former children's laureate and author of more than 140 books is well known for his commitment to social causes, paying tribute to the UK's health service with an anniversary poem, These Are the Hands, in 2008. Twelve years later, his own life was in their hands as he battled COVID-19, an experience that involved weeks in an induced coma. He revisits that time in a new book, Many Different Kinds of Love, and he joins us now to tell us more. Michael Rosen, thank you so much for being with us today. Now, it's great to see that you're Thanks looking... Thanks for asking me. It's great to see that you're looking a lot better than this time last year, but I believe you are still suffering from the long-term effects of COVID. How did you find the energy and the concentration to put together this extremely moving book? Well, as your body starts to fail, or as it's coming out of a period of failure, and it's a kind of combination, long COVID is like bits of failing at the same time as recovering. Luckily, my mind was mostly intact. So a great refuge, if you like, was to sit and think and to write, to daydream and to write. And that helped me put my experience into some kind of shape, into some kind of order. The book is made up of fragments of prose, and some of the text comes from notes written by the healthcare workers who looked after you while you were in an induced coma. Sophie, Lizzie, Daniel, Eloise, Natasha, Eva, and many others all wrote to you recording your progress. When did you discover these patient diaries and how did you feel when you read them? I can remember in the hospital people saying that I had a patient diary. In fact, I've got it right here. I can show you. There we are. It says patient diary. Um, and you can see it's a notebook. It's a little cahier um, and uh, with the little spiral bound. And you can see here um, the nurse's entries in the book. And they told me it was there. And then uh, it came back with me from the hospital and it sat on our kitchen table. And my wife would point at it and she'd say, that's your diary. That's, that's about when you were in a coma in an induced coma, and uh, I couldn't bear to read it. Um, so it was some time before I actually brought myself to go through it and, and read what, what the nurses and physios and the helpers who were drafted in to help with those of us in intensive care. During that terrifying time, you suffered from bouts of delirium. You described the strange and vivid dreams that you had. It sounds truly frightening, quite overwhelming. We talk about the physical effects of COVID, but did you worry about the effects on your mental or emotional health? I, I came home at the end of June. So I'd been in a rehabilitation hospital for three weeks and I thought as each minute went by that I was conscious and knew what was going on. By the time I came home, I started to realise that I was forgetting things and that I couldn't understand things that I would normally understand. My wife would say, you were in intensive care or uh, we're going on holiday, actually, to France, or not going on holiday to France. And then I'd forget that she told me, and then the next day she would say it again. And she'd say, well, I told you that yesterday. And I'd think, oh, right, yeah. And then something quite comical, um, I would forget uh, very famous Hollywood film stars. I started to call it Hollywood film star forgetting syndrome. <laughs> the only way I could describe it. I forgot Tom Cruise's name, uh, George Clooney's name, and Meryl Streep's name. And it's kept happening until now you can see, I just stumbled slightly over Meryl Streep. Um, but there was a period where whatever great Hollywood star you could mention, I couldn't remember their name. Michael, how has poetry or literature more generally been a comfort for you during this time? A lot. Uh, literature contains us. Uh, you could use an image of the idea of a bowl and that we're in the bowl and literature is the bowl, it holds us, because you have a thought and you can, as it were, um, rebound, go, go into the literature to comfort you, to provoke you. And so, for example, you know, I found myself thinking of Odysseus, who goes to the land of the dead, breaks all the rules because he comes out again. And the more people spoke to me about the coma and how near I was to death, possibly two or three times, I, I, I used that image. I started finding that image very comforting that Odysseus got in and got out again. And the idea of getting past Cerberus, the guard dog. So literature is a great comfort and a great place to go. 
Now, your books have taken very difficult things and rendered them, if not easy, accessible for children and young people. For example, The Missing delves into your personal family history to discuss the Holocaust and the Second World War, and making sure those stories live on seems ever more relevant and important today. Now, with this international health crisis, the harrowing year we've spent with millions lost, how do we explain this to children today and in the future? I think we have to be as plain and as accurate as we possibly can. So we're talking about a virus. We're not talking about some strange, mystical little creature. We have to explain what viruses are. And they are in their own way, um, you know, quite difficult to describe because they're not exactly living and they're not dead. We also have to talk about how we are, if, if you like, distributing viruses between us and that it's what's called an aerosol. So we have to explain that stuff as best we can. We need scientists to lay it all out for us and, and make it simple and accurate, because there are a lot of nutty conspiracy theories about, which, which don't understand what viruses are, and, and why we, on the one hand, we live with some and it doesn't do as much damage, like the common cold, and others can, and also they're different from bacteria. When it comes to the political management of this crisis in the UK, how do you see the role of those in power in terms of doing due diligence to protect the population? I think that in February and the beginning of March, they totally failed us. That they were either covertly or inadvertently pursuing a policy of what they were calling and other people were calling herd immunity, and that's without vaccination. Remember, we had no vaccines. And so there was a thought amongst uh, top government scientists and people in government, that if you let this virus run through the population, most people would survive. It was a mild virus. A few people would die, but it wouldn't matter very much because they're old or they're sick anyway. So this was negligent. I'm going to avoid using other words. It was negligent. And I think uh, at various points, an explicit, cam an explicit policy uh, to try and solve this crisis with what they call herd immunity and it's rubbish biology. You yourself have dealt with political topics in your poetry, things like fascism, immigration, and you wrote a poem for the children of Gaza in 2009. Uh, since then, the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians has gone through various chapters, uh, most recently with devastating consequences. But when it comes to speaking out against that as an artist, a broadcaster, do you feel that today, as some people suggest, uh, the debate has become more black and white, it's become totally polarised. It is polarised, it is. It's, and of course, that, that doesn't solve anything. At the end of the day, the parties on the ground are going to have to resolve it in some way or another as equals, but at the moment that isn't happening. There's no peace process, let's not pretend there is. Um, the idea of two states is certainly jeopardised by the presence of settlers in the, in the West Bank. So there must be some process that has to start where the parties on the ground resolve it as equals, whatever that may be. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't live in Israel. My links with my Jewish family are with France, uh, America and Poland. Um, I'm a, you know, a classic European Jew. So I look at Israel and I don't feel that it's, it's as it were mine or to do with me. I wrote that poem uh, about children of Gaza because they'd been bombed. I wrote another one called Don't Mention the Children because it had been forbidden to publish the names of the dead children, uh, dead children, non-Jewish children. So, you know, I, I thought, well, why is that? Why are you banning the publishing of the names of children? So that was another poem I wrote. Yeah. I mean, I, that, that's, that's how I respond as, as an artist, as you say. Now, your passion for language, words and sounds extends to a special radio programme in the UK called Word of Mouth. And I particularly enjoyed the episode on the presence of French or Anglo-Norman words in English. Uh, what is your favourite French word or phrase, I must ask you? On y soit qui mal y pense. That's, <laughs> that's quite good, isn't it? Um, and I think it's a kind of joke. I mean, if I remember it rightly, was that this was a gentleman who... Um, I think, uh, found a lady's garter, it was on her leg at the time, I think, um, on which was written, on Iswaki Mali Pans. And so, uh, you know, you can figure out the layers of irony within that, and that it should have been on her, her upper, upper leg. Now, finally, we asked you to flag up what's on your cultural radar, and you mentioned the television series, Line of Duty. What got you hooked on that one? 
Uh, well, hooked is the right word. I think <laughs> when you have a series where you you don't know who's the the dodgy one, who's the rogue, who's the villain, who's straight, and then as it unfolds, you start wondering whether maybe they all are. Uh, this is very compelling. I mean, hooked is the right word. That, that hooks you in. I was reminded at times by the French series, uh, L'Engrenage, Spiral in, on British telly. OK, well, thank you very much for the tip. It sounds like I should follow it up. Michael Rosen, thank you so much for being with us today. We'll leave you with a little clip of Line of Duty. Remember, you can get more arts and culture on our website. We're also on social media. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. There is no corruption in this police force. A bare-faced liar promoted to our highest office. You should investigate. Believe me, we will. You have no idea what she's capable of. The whole line of inquiry has been deliberately suppressed to protect organised crime. Gee, I had nothing to do with it. All I know is somebody's behind all this. I'm being free! No! When did we stop caring about honesty and integrity?